proceed. You might have noticed that under your seat um, there's a, a stone. Uh, for 2024, we're adopting a, a more immediate system of sermon feedback. Uh, and so if, if you don't appreciate the sermon, uh, that's what that's there for. Astrid's going to come and preach. Let, let, having given her that introduction, let me pray for Astrid. Lord, thank you for the way that you speak through Astrid. Thank you for her wisdom and her, her gift in bringing your word to us. And Lord, I pray that you'd speak powerfully to every one of us this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's great when you have to stand up after that kind of strength, knowing I've given you ammunition. Um, this morning we're starting a new teaching series, and we're calling it Fresh, because this is a brand new year. And we're going to, over the next few weeks, be looking at areas of our Christian life and Christian walk and encouraging um, us all to think about, is this time for God to do something fresh in this area of our, our life? Is this an opportunity for us to recommit and ask God to do something new? So this morning, we're going to look at a fresh start. Now, who has an Instagram account or follow somebody on an Instagram account? <clears throat> yep, some of us, some of us, um, others of us. Does anybody not know what Instagram is at all? Yeah, some of us might not. Um, basically, and I will be corrected, I'm sure, but Wiki tells me it's a photo and video sharing social networking service. Basically, by individuals and by organizations to promote themselves, their brand, and so on. And kind of the value of your Instagram account is measured by how many followers you have. So top of the list, when I looked the other day, is Ronaldo, the Portuguese footballer who has just over 615 million followers. And Messi comes in next. He has just over 495 million followers. And the TV personality, Kim Kardashian, has just over 364 million followers. Why do people follow people on Instagram? Well, in part, it's because we have this need for social connection. And we have a need for belonging with those who share similar interests and similar values and similar beliefs. And we might be interested in what that person or that organization has to share. People follow for reasons of aspiration. They want to be like that person. Or inspiration, they think that person has got something worth saying. And because it's social media, we can as easily unfollow someone as we might follow them. Our Bible reading today comes from Mark 1, um, and we're going to read just a few verses, verses 16 to 20. And it's the story of Jesus inviting his first disciples to follow him. Um, you'll find it on page 1002. It's right at the beginning of Mark. If you want to grab a Bible, please do. Jesus invites his first disciples to follow him, not in a social media fashion where we can passively engage with him at no cost or little cost to ourselves. Instead, Jesus calls us to uh, have an active relationship with him, which requires us to give of our all. And this is a story um, of, of some of Jesus' disciples responding to his call. And I'm starting at verse 16 in chapter 1 of Mark. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me. Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he'd gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, 
preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. In Jesus' day, it wasn't unusual for young men to follow a rabbi um, so that they could learn things from their teacher. But in this account of Mark and his, uh, um, in this account of Jesus and his followers responding, coming together, it doesn't fit what probably would have been the normal pattern. And I want us to notice three things in these verses. The first thing is this: normally, the disciple would seek their rabbi out. The disciple would find their rabbi, and instead we see Jesus coming and finding his followers. Whether you've come to faith through your family upbringing, through Alpha, through friends, or through any other means, Jesus first planted a curiosity in us, which we then responded to. Even when we use the language, I came to faith, when? I came to faith, how? Jesus plants that curiosity in us to begin with. Jesus is the rabbi who seeks out his followers, even if it feels like we made the first move. The second thing that I want us to notice in these three verses is that usually before committing to follow a rabbi, the would-be disciple would do their homework they would consider the rabbi's reputation. And they might talk to other students that had followed that rabbi um, and, and, and find out what they'd learned from that rabbi. They might observe how the other students had, had, had turned out. Instead, we see the disciples responding straight away. According to the author of a book called The Five Second Rule, the moment you have an instinct to act on a goal, you must act on it or start to act on it within five seconds. Otherwise, your brain will start leaning towards procrastination. It's just the way our brains work, so I'm told. I wonder how often Jesus calls us to do something and we fail to respond because we leave it too long. We go, yes, and then we think, and then it doesn't happen. Jesus is the rabbi who asks us not to delay when it comes to following him. The third thing I want us to notice is that Jesus is really precise as to what they should expect. He says, I'm going to teach you to fish for people. In other translations, uh, we find the phrase, a fisher of men. And that might seem like quite a strange phrase to us, but it was a really common phrase to philosophers um, and, and other teachers in Jesus' day who used it to describe the capturing of people's minds through teaching and persuasions. Jesus is offering them a warning. He's saying, my invitation is going to be captivating, it's going to be enchanting, it's going to be inspiring, it's going to be absorbing, so much so that it's going to invade every part of your life. And that invitation is no less radical today. Over a dozen times in the Bible, Jesus will say, follow me to people who are interested in him. It's a personal call. And the follow bit is something we do, but the focus of our attention is on the person we are following before anything else. Jesus says, follow me. I came across a story recently written by somebody called Elizabeth Elliot. It's not in the Bible, so it's not, you won't find it anywhere in the Bible, but it's a creative piece of writing about Jesus and his disciples. And so we might call it a modern day parable. And this is, this is how it goes. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, I'd like you to carry a stone for me. 
He didn't give any explanation. So the disciples looked around for a stone to carry. And Peter, being the practical sort, found a, a, a small stone. After all, Jesus didn't give any specification as to weight and size. And so he put it in his pocket and Jesus said, follow me. And then he led them on a journey. When it was time for lunch, Jesus had everybody sit down. He waved his hands over the stones and they turned to bread. Peter's lunch was over in a very few seconds. After lunch, Jesus said again, I'd like stone for me. And this time Peter said, aha, I get this. So he looked around and he found a small boulder. He hoisted it on his back. It was really painful to carry and it made him stagger. But he said to himself, I can't wait for supper. Jesus then said, follow me. He led them on a journey with Peter barely being able to keep up. Around supper time, Jesus led them to the side of a river, and he said, now everyone, throw your stones into the water. They did. And then he said, follow me, and started to walk on. And Peter and the others just looked at him, him dumbfounded. Jesus sighed and said, don't you remember what I asked you to do? Who were you carrying the stone for? Whether we believe that we're doing the bare minimum for Jesus or staggering under the weight of doing things for him, that are uh, doing things that are Jesus-related, the point of the story is that so often we miss what it means to follow Jesus. Our focus all too often is on what Jesus might do for us rather than focusing on simply doing what Jesus has asked us to do for him. So often we fail to place um, our focus on him and rather we look at what we expect and what we uh, get in terms of the effort that we've put in uh, and so on. Our faith is about being obedient rather than looking at the outcomes or the inspiring results or even the personal fulfillment that we might get from following Jesus. The Christian life is about following the Christ life. Jesus doesn't say, follow my rules, follow my church, Follow my activities, follow my morality, or even follow my teaching, even though those things will be part of our journey with him. What he says is, come get to know me. Come and follow me. We so often put the emphasis on the action verb, follow, instead of on the me the person. First of all, Christianity is about knowing Jesus, about loving Jesus, about worshipping Jesus, about serving Jesus, about cherishing Jesus and obeying him. Jesus is the rabbi who asks us to follow him. And we've already promised to do that today in our covenant commitment that we, we shared just a few moments ago. Borrowing that language from the, the modern day parable, we've just promised to, fo- to carry a stone for Jesus this year. Not for ourselves, not for success, not for reputation, not to accomplish some great dream we have in our heart or agenda that we hold in our head. We've just promised to carry a stone for him. And it's unconditional. Matthew records Jesus later on in his ministry saying, um, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And criminals in Jesus' time would carry their own cross um, before they were were crucified. 
Um, and, and, and so what Jesus is saying is, if you follow him, we've got to endure the burdens of a life of faith, no matter what the consequences are. In other words, it means living for Jesus' sake and not for our own. So just as the disciples didn't know where their journey was going to take them, or what the job description was going to be, or what ministry calendar they were going to be following, so it is for us. When Jesus says, follow me, he doesn't give us all of the points and the details along the way. This year, we are simply called to follow him, to go where he says, go. And Simon and Andrew and James and John, they were excited enough by this invitation to leave their livelihood behind immediately. And I I experienced something of that strength and excitement of call when God said, leave a career and train to, um, to go into ministry. And many of us will know the excitement of a call that God has made on our life that has caused us to make decision-changing, um, direction-changing decisions is what I've written down here. That sounds better, doesn't it? It might be putting our faith in Jesus for the first time. That's changed our life. It might mean moving home. That's changed our life. It might mean coming forward for prayer ministry. That changes our life. It might be serving God in a particular way. That changes our life. It might be breaking a habit or adopting a new habit. That changes our life. And it's all because we've heard that call. Jesus says, follow me. And the challenge for us as Jesus followers, no matter how dramatic or how significant these life-changing or direction-defining moments are, it's really easy as time goes on to find ourselves following Jesus with something less than a full heart. We get weary, we get complacent, we just get used to the same old, the same old. Today is a fresh start. And we've declared that fresh start in the covenant statements we've shared today. We've promised to follow Jesus, offering him the whole of our lives, to be obedient, to be open to his transforming work in us. In other words, open to him changing ourselves, to lower barriers within our hearts and within our minds that cause us to resist change or resist him. So we're going to use our imagination for a moment. Imagine what Sunday morning would look like if we applied a first disciple approach and immediately responded to Jesus' call to follow him. Someone, or someones, might come forward in the middle of the sermon, sit there ready for a prayer ministry, because something has spoken to them, and they can't wait. Five seconds, they've gone. They're there. They're waiting. They need to respond right here, right now. Just imagine if we responded to Jesus in the middle of communion, And we found that there were people crisscrossing across the room, hugging and crying and laughing. Because in that moment, Jesus said, you've got to forgive. And you can't wait till a nice, quiet, private time. But you walk in the quiet and the hallowedness of communion. But you do it in the moment. You respond immediately because that's what a first disciple of Jesus did. What if in the middle of worship we suddenly thought, I can't just stand here. La, 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 I can't sing. I've got to wave my arms or I've got to kneel down or I've got to lie down or I've got to dance. We sing songs like standing with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. 
Have we ever lay on the ground lost in wonder, love and praise during our time of sung worship? And I can hear some of us saying, but I'm just not like that. That's not me. But what if Jesus said, follow me? As soon as we think, we put up a barrier to following Jesus. Sometimes we're compelled to respond right here and right now. And yes, church would be messy. It would be messy. We wouldn't quite know what was happening and why somebody was doing this or whatever. But would that matter? In our leadership prayer meeting this morning, somebody prayed that we might be less in control. They had no idea what I was preaching on. It's been prayed for this morning. So beware. It was one of the leadership team that prayed that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch you in a moment, Stacey. Is that all right? Um, so she's saying something completely different to what she's preaching. Uh, but, but bear with. I'm a bra- bear with a little brain and I shall completely lose my point. But do you see what Sunday could look like? We could have interruptions. We could have somebody coming up and saying, I really need to share a story. We could have somebody speaking out. I think God's saying something, and it's a prophetic word, and and, and I, I can't hold it in any longer. I've got to do this. It would be messy, but do you know this would be a church where we would see lives being changed immediately. We might see healing happen immediately. We might see a freedom that we haven't yet seen. I think that would be really excited, exciting, don't you? And if you think about it for five seconds, you'll say no. Because you'll think that's new, that's different. And it's tough. But you see, we trust We trust the Holy Spirit. Spirit's not going to do something crazy and wild that we're not comfortable enough with. But the Holy Spirit doesn't want us a year down the line to make those promises again, thinking, I actually haven't changed. The same things that I felt convicted over in 2024, I'm feeling in 2025. The same things that I hoped I'd get right in 2024, I know I've still got to get right in 2025. That would be the heart and the nature of our church. We would have cues of people saying how God's changed them daily, weekly, monthly, as well as the... um, Uh, as well as maybe asking at the beginning of the year. Would we have problems with rotors for activities if we responded in five seconds or a few more? No. Because if God said, Paul, I want you to do this, or I want you not to do that, we'd respond in the moment, and that would give freedom for God to do what he then has to do. And would we look at our rotor and think, oh no, it's not me again. We'd go, no, because I'm serving Jesus. This is about following him. Would we think, I don't think I'm good enough to do this? No, because we'd have a culture of us encouraging one another so much that we'd be ready to step into something new. Would we feel worn out because we do too much around here? No, because there would be people clamoring to get involved. Just imagine what it would be like to be part of a church like that. Because you see, that's what Jesus was getting at when he called those first disciples and said, come, follow me. And they went, ah, and he said, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Oh, okay. You know, that was left in the boat. 
That's how Mark puts it. Dad was left in the boat as his son said, yes, I will follow him. So today is a call to a fresh start. And it starts with the decision to follow him. And it continues with daily decisions to follow him. Some of our decisions will be really little. We might bite our tongue before we're critical. And we might find something nice to say instead without following it up with a but. Some decisions will be really costly. We don't fancy getting involved in that area of church life because it means I'll have to give up free time. But giving up that time to do something would be a more Christ-centered use of my time. Some decisions will be huge. How can I forgive that person after what they've done to me? It might be we have to make lots of little decisions so eventually we find ourselves having forgiven that person or those people. And some decisions will be life-changing. I know God's calling me to change direction. doesn't feel like the right time. But will it ever be the right time if you think about it? Maybe God is saying, do it, make the decision. And do it now. Certainly in my story, God spoke to me. I said, yes, that's what I'm going to do. He then had the grace to give me months to get used to the idea before it had to actually be put into action. Because you see, he knows us. He knows us. He knows what we need. And it was interesting, just as an aside when we were at Bible College, the number of people that had applied, got interviewed and got in within a space of uh, two or three weeks even. They were the real immediate, I'm going to make it happen and I'm going to go. The disciples followed Jesus without knowing much about him, without knowing so much of his reputation, without even knowing what the outcome was going to be. They didn't need their heads to be in line. They just responded in and with their heart. And I think that this is what God is calling us to be, a people who respond with our hearts, even if our heads need to catch up with the decision that we've made. So I'm going to encourage you, if you would, to pick up your stone and I would encourage you, if you can, to refrain from throwing it at me. <laughs> I know that thought has been put in your mind and I just want to try and remove it. <coughs> I'm going to encourage you to stand. And we're going to hold on to our stone. And, and there should be, there, there are some around, not one under absolutely every seat, but there hopefully will be enough. I'm going to encourage you to hold your stone. And we're going to pray. You see, today is a call to a fresh start. To come to him, to get away with him, to walk with him, to work with him, to watch him, to learn from him, to keep company with him, to hear his invitation, to pick up a stone and to follow him into the day or the week or the year ahead. Lord Jesus, you said, come follow me. Thank you that you've said you will provide for us all that we need. Lord, we recognize today that following you is more than important than anything else in the world. Lord, help us to follow you as our number one priority. To listen to you to say yes to you and then see how you work out the consequences. 
Lord, as we worship you, we hold this stone, we hold our stones. Lord, we thank you for the invitation. And Lord, as we hold this stone, we wait for you. How do you want us to respond immediately? Is there someone that we must forgive? Is there someone that we need to encourage? Is there something that you want us to change? Is there somewhere you want us to be? Lord, is there an attitude that you want us to change? Are there fears that you want us to put to one side? Lord, reveal to us the things that act as a barrier to following you. Help us to climb over them, to squash them down, or to move around them. Lord, might we follow you this year. We know it won't be easy, but help us to trust you. Holy Spirit, strengthen us when we fail. Be the gentle word that puts us back on track. Help us to be like those first disciples. Amen.